Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. This is Sid from Elliott Way Plus, and this is the January 9 of 2024 edition of my uh, premium plan webinar. It's my quarterly webinar where I really just unveil uh, everything that I do. Um, and so uh, I plan on leaving nothing out. So uh, we had a big snow day here today had the whole day to sit here and, and uh, prepare for the webinar and I've got lots to show you. So uh, let's get started. Um, before we get into the nuts and bolts of this thing, I uh, want to show you uh, my disclaimer. It's at my website, elliotwayplus.com. Please go to the site scroll all the way down to the bottom of any page there and click on the terms of service disclaimer tab and there's the disclaimer it's there all the time please go there and read that in full if i were to summarize it in one sentence it would be there's risk of loss in all trading um i'd like to take you first to um, a couple of things one is I want you to be aware of my YouTube channel. It's at, uh, it's called Elliott Way Plus. <clears throat> so there it is. And um, I will put a, a new video up there um, approximately quarterly. And um, I, I got a question to ask of the participants and please use the, the webinar chat. Um, how many of you are aware of any Elliott wave counting service that has essentially the same wave count today as they did six months ago. So I'm sure some of you subscribe maybe to some other Elliott wave services. Yeah. I'm getting an answer of none and, uh, one, one says two, two, and I, I think I know which two services those are. Um, I don't know any, anything about NeoWay, but um, anyway, so I wanted to remind you very quickly, and I'm going to turn off the video of myself so you can see this, um, of what my wave count was uh, uh, three months ago. So three months ago, and this happens to be on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, I was bullish immediately. This webinar was done on a Sunday, uh, October 29, and I was bullish through uh, December 23, 24. And that was based on Hearst cycle analysis, which I integrate heavily into my work. I also mentioned, uh, I'll represent to you that I mentioned during that video, which is available for you to go make sure I'm not lying to you. Uh, that uh, if the market was going to stay up through approximately Christmas, it would probably stay up through year end. The only thing I missed on, uh, which cycle analysis really doesn't address, is how far up this uh, move would go. In, the case, in this case, the Dow Jones Industrial Average ended the year ever so slightly into new all-time high ter uh, territory, so just above this green line. Um, Whereas the S and P still has failed and has has hasn't quite made a new all time high above the January high of twenty twenty two twenty twenty two. So that was my uh, count. Um, and, and let's see if I can go back a little bit and show the larger larger count. There we go. And what I was predicting is that uh, up from the March of 2020 low uh, wave, uh, that initial move up was in three waves for wave one of an eventual ending contracting diagonal. And then we get an uh, essentially an ABC structure down for wave two of the diagonal. 
and that it was unfinished <clears throat> and that the market would stay up in through late December. And, and um, but eventually the diagonal would end in uh, late 2025, early 2026 um, as a uh, ending contracting diagonal. So that was my wave count uh, three months ago on the, on the stock market. And then I'm going to go back to, let's see here, the June, uh, no, the June, yeah, July 21 quarterly premium plants women. And there was my wave count at the time on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Three waves up for wave one of the diagonal, an ABC structure for wave two of the diagonal, and then it would move on up through late 2025, early 2026 time frame. As you see, that that wave count uh, really didn't change, oh, and that was six months ago. So moving to current uh, situation, um, I'll, I'll show you very quickly the weekly chart on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And despite the fact that it made an ever so slight new all-time high, um, that wave count has not been invalidated. And um, the reason is because uh, I've been labeling this as a expected WXY pattern. And in a WXY pattern, it's a little different than an ABC zigzag. It's a double zigzag. But uh, the middle y, uh, X uh, wave can make a new extreme above the beginning of the pattern. So three waves down for W, then three waves up for X, and then a three wave down for two. So that, that wave count is, is uh, the same now as it was three months ago, and it's the same as it was uh, six months ago. How about the S&P? Here's the weekly on the S and P. Same thing. Um, in this case, I am I'm still labeling it a W X Y and it and it or possibly a triple zigzag, A B C for W, A B C for X, A B C for Y, and A B C for um, possibly another X here and, and a Z possible triple zigzag. So even if the S and P makes a slight new high. And I mentioned this in the in the video six months ago. Uh, it, it's not going to uh, invalidate this count. Um, and so my expectation is uh, up from the March of 2020 low. Um, we're in a diagonal. Well, if any of you have uh, been long time Elliotitians and have tried to trade through uh, a diagonal, you know how difficult it can be. Uh, sometimes the, le the especially the first leg of a contracting diagonal can be very, very easy to count as an ABC zigzag, just like this one was. How many of you subscribe to a service that thought that the um, January 2022 high was going to be as high as we ever see in the stock market during our lifetimes. Anybody subscribe to that mainstream Elliott wave? Yeah. Well, they were wrong again, weren't they? Um, you know, the mainstream Elliott wave, I, um, since uh, this is the reason why I added Hearst cycle analysis to uh, to my toolbox because it uh, I needed something to remove bias. Needed something to remove bias from my toolbox uh, altogether, and. Um, Hearst has been extremely beneficial in that way. I think there was lots and lots of people forcing a five wave count on this move to the upside in the S and P. Um, but to me, I, I counted it in real time. I never ever suggested this was going to be the, the top. 
uh, Hearst analysis was suggesting that that was going to be in either late 2025 or early 2026. And uh, so far, that analysis is still working very well. But I, the most important thing about the count was I counted this as an ABC zigzag. And I felt like the subdivisions were and the Fibonacci relationships within that structure were proper for a zigzag. In other words, you count up five waves from that low, one, two, three, four, five for A. Take that times 0.618 and add that amount to that pink wave A top, and you get this dotted line right here. And that is where wave C equaled a point a, a very common 0.618 expansion of wave A, and that's um, a lot of the uh, Fibonacci uh, methods that I'm using now <clears throat> are completely different from the Fibonacci methods that are spelled out in the blue book. Uh, and when I say blue book, the Frost and Prector book. Um, and that really good looking uh, ABC zigzag with all the proper subdivisions, the five, three, five subdivisions to that exact target would never spelled out five waves up. And now that whole idea really is, it is turning out to just be wrong. <clears throat> it never was a five, it was a three. But when you look at the very long-term Fibonacci targets, and I've gone over these and these in prior webinars, uh, free to the public many times. There's a cluster of targets up here, and I'm showing them on the Dow now, between 41,020 and 43,652 that, uh, that haven't been hit yet. That, those that target zone, those target zones are targets for the end of wave five of five of five of five, up from the 1932 low. The one I think that is going to be the most important is the the one uh, that is suggesting the best target for a fifth wave up from the 2009 low. And we're going to move in just a little closer uh, on the monthly chart and see one, two, one, two, three, four, three, four. And then the ABC, very strong zigzag out of the March of 2020 low that traveled about 80% of the way toward that target zone. That had to be wave one of a diagonal, of an ending contracting diagonal. So the wave one's the longest, and then you get a, a, a wave three that is shorter than wave one was, and a wave five that's shorter than wave one. So that target zone, it still is in focus. And at least on its monthly chart, it doesn't look like it's that much higher up. Um, but I think the market is going to shred traders it's going to be very very volatile with large swings uh until we finally ter terminate uh, in approximately may of 2026 probably toward the top of that target zone so back to the s p the idea on the s p is identical and i thought because so many people look at the s p i wanted to just get this out of the way um, early that um, I don't think the S&P is topped. So the question becomes, and I'm going to move into a weekly chart for this, how much more upside is there to the S&P? Well, from current levels to um, where black wave five will e equal the net travel to black w one through three, there's black four times 0.618 that has been a very very reliable fibonacci target for the end of a fifth wave uh ever since i switched to that using that uh years many years ago so uh upside from here uh there's 14 percent more of upside on 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 the s p as all 
to that target zone. But the the way it's going to get there, I think it's going to be particularly nasty. Uh, this uh, plunge down through mid-2024 is going to be something along the lines of a 40% a plunge in, in the markets if, if, if this wave count is correct. Yeah, 40%. Then, uh, and that is to a target on, on the uh, S and P of twenty eight sixty. That would finish wave two of this ongoing diagonal A B C for one, W X Y or W X Y X Z for two, wave two. There's a target zone between thirty eighty seven and twenty eight sixty. For the end of wave two, and that's based on an expansion target of this initial leg down. So if this is a unit of one, take that times 0.618 would make the best target and add that to that low, and you get a target down around 2865, uh, 2860. But then at that low, and that's coming, this year, approximately mid-year, possibly as late as the third quarter, we would get uh, a huge upside opportunity of uh, something along the lines of, well, really, to the ultimate target, almost a double from there, back up to new all-time highs, really twice. Um, so, and then I think that's the uh, top of Grand Super Cycle Wave 3. That is the end of the, uh, will be the end of the road of the secular bull market that started in the year 1932. So one, two, three, four, and an extremely extended fifth wave. One, two, three, four, five. And so, you know, these next couple of years are going to be difficult for most uh, market participants. Um, trading inside of a diagonal is a difficult business. And I just uh, want to show you how difficult it has been. So uh, one of the things I cover in the premium plan webinar is uh, our momentum algos. Well, I got to tell you, the mo and what I do on the momentum algos is I, I optimize them to the last three years of price action. So here's what the last, that would be starting right here. Now that first year of the, of the back test was a nice, sm uh, smooth, trending, um, uh, uh, uptrend, but ever since uh, the all-time high in January of 2022, the, the character of the market has changed into something that is very choppy, very overlapping, very noisy. Now, yeah, we just got through with a two-month uh, rally that wasn't noisy, but for the majority of the last two years have been very, very noisy. And um, so I'm going to finish with the S&P and then, then I'm going to move to the algo and I'm going to show you some backtest uh, stats that I have where we, uh, I just got through backtesting on a three-year backtest and optimization. Uh, dozens of tradable, popular tradable items and we're going to sort those and look at which ones have been smooth, uh, tr um, uh, trending the smoothest. So um, momentum algos do particularly well in a trending environment. They look for momentum, they jump on board, and they ride it until they see a loss of momentum. That's what my that's what momentum algos do. <clears throat> now, that being said, if you're in a choppy overlapping environment. 
like here, all the way through here, they don't do as well. And so they will give back some of their profits during the choppy sideways uh, consolidations. And, but only when you get into a nice strong trend, do they uh, bring home the bacon, so to speak. And hopefully the winners that um, are experienced during that uh, uh, trending price action offset by a sizable amount, the losers that have to be endured during during a sideways price action. Before we, um, I did want to show you this uh, uh, main count on the S&P that suggests we're in a topping area. And I'm, I'm going to talk extensively about this, this topping zone and why I think it's dangerous to try to force um, an opinion, either long or short, during a topping process. And I think that's what we're in on the S&P right now. But is, I'm, my main count is that we have a top in. My alternate count is that we won't see the top until late January. Um, so uh, very quickly, uh, I made some um, screenshots of um, first analysis on the S&P. I did do one 40 week repin right here and I'll re represent to you that it without that repin it put it it was putting it right here. Now that's not probably where a 40 week cycle trough would be so I moved it to the a location where it'd be more more fitting for a large cycle trough. But I'll, I'll also represent to you that whether or not I do that repin has it makes no difference moving forward. It still is calling this a late October low of, of last year, an 80-day cycle trough. And it was predicting that we were going to get a rally out of that trough that would last through very late in the year, as I've already showed you. That, that was, it, was already, it was already predicting that six months ago and then three months ago. Um, it was still predicting it. And the, the matter of fact, the high point of the composite line on the S and P analysis is December 17. Now, when I did this, um, free webinar three months ago, it was suggesting December 23, 24 timeframe. And notice that that is the high point of the composite line. So this is software I use extensively. It's sentient trader software. It is designed to provide a Hearst cycle analysis. Uh, and so what it does is it looks at um, sometimes all the peaks and the troughs, but when you do the stock market, only the troughs, it looks at the troughs and figures out um, um, how they fit into a Hearst cycle analysis. So Hearst cycle analysis, the longest cycle that this software software figures out is an 18 year. Then it figures a nine year. So there's two nine year cycles within an 18 year. And then it figures a four and a half year cycle. There's two four and a half year cycles within each nine year. And moving down from there, an 18 month cycle. There's three 18 month cycles within a four and a half year cycle. And then there's four, 40 week, there's two 40 week cycles within an 18 month and on down from there, 40 week, 20 week, 10 week. That's an 80 day, then a 40 day, 20 day, 10 day and five day. And it figures all of those at the same time. And each one is uh, either in an up cycle or a down cycle. And it basically gives equal weight to all of those cycles. I uh, can't remember how many there are. There's uh, about a dozen different cycles that it figures out. It gives equal weight to each one. And then the composite line, this orange line, predicts when the market is going to be moving up 
in when it's going to be moving down based on how many of those cycles are pointing up at the at the, that time and how many are pointing down. So you look at this uh, analysis right here. If this is a 40-week cycle trough, that is the 40-week cycle. It's been moving up, but now it's starting to apply downward pressure. Within that 40-week cycle, there's two 20-week cycles up, up here. and um, But that 20-week cycle is very important at the moment because it's been pointing to the downside into this cycle, 20-week cycle trough nest. And that is why the composite line, it was projecting downward movement through January 5 and then upward movement through January 26. Uh, oh, yeah, that needs to say 2024, Chris. Yes, excellent. That's a, that's a typo. I need to, that needs to be May 19, 2024. And see this cycle trough nest that goes down in here? It's staggered. So it's likely to end down in here in June, possibly July, but the composite line only goes down through May 19th. So that's why a lot of times on my charts, I will show you where the composite line bottoms and also where the center of that, that cyclic nest, the 20 week cycle trough nest is. And you can see that this downward movement, and I've warned my subscribers of this, even though my main count is that this needs to move down in five waves here, this 20 week the existence of this 20 week cycle trough is so soon it was going to happen this week that it, it very well could be we couldn't get a five wave down structure right there and this isn't going to be the top and we're going to get it over here on Friday or on Sunday, two days ago in the webinar, I, I, I asked how many how many are short the market here now? And there was a couple that fessed up to being short. And I said, you need to really be careful here because there's a 20 week cycle trough nest due this coming week. And if we can't get a five wave down structure down into that low, then um, we may not have a top in what we saw last week was some downward movement, but it really wasn't very strong. It was only strong in the Russell. Now, you, you'll notice, guys, this time um, that um, I'm, the way I'm rolling in this webinar is more like very much more similar to what I do on a weekly basis every Sunday as part of the pro plan, where I just... I start with the U.S. indices. I start rolling through um, all the things I cover, and about three hours later, I've got everything done. And this is this is what one of those webinars is normally like. But as you can see, um, it's dangerous to say short here, in my opinion. Uh, and um, there's reason to believe that this market and the S and P might scoot up and make a slight new all-time high by the time we get to late January. And this is uh, this is why it's important on the composite line to take um, take heed of a couple of, of very important notions about city and trader analysis. This composite line, the orange dotted line, doesn't represent price. It represents direction. So this isn't suggesting oh, that after starting January twenty six. This is going to move down through May 19 of 2024, and it's going to move down to about 3,900. That's not what it means. What it means is the, the, the cycles are all lining up for a move to the downside from approximately late January through mid-May. Okay. So that's it. This could be a, a, a devastating collapse like we saw in, in March of 2020, or it could be something that isn't as serious. We don't know yet. And cycle analysis really doesn't tell us which one of those is going to be, but it does tell us something really important, and that is direction. So, so it, it, and notice that this dip 
didn't amount to much. And we already got to January five. It didn't amount to much to the downside. And, and we're probably going to stay up. Market's probably going to stay up now through Jan 26. And that's why I've got this as, um, and I was working on this today, that needs to say alt. And uh, this other one needs to say main, but uh, I'm going to show you some more stuff now that, that's very similar to what I show in, in the weekly webinars uh, ab about this topping process. So we're going to get into that in a second. So that I've showed you all the quarterly chart, the monthly chart, the weekly chart, and the daily chart on the S&P this time. So I've shared a lot with you that I don't normally share uh, during these free events. Other S&P charts that I keep, I keep a, a, a basic daily trend chart. This this trend chart, the, the green boxes um, are, and this is kind of a proprietary system, um, are buy zone boxes. And the pink boxes are sell zone boxes. So, and, and then there's a couple of other indicators on here, an adaptive moving average and an ATR volatility stop. And one other one, and that is the ADX indicator, what I, which I think is a very important indicator. ADX indicator, when it's over 60 on a daily chart, is deeply overbought. Matter of fact, the, the, the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average recently reached an 89.41. So anything above 60... On, on a daily chart on the, this ADX indicator that indicates that the trend, whichever direction it is going, is ex really pushing the end of the envelope. I mean, it's it's just this the trend is way overdone. And that 8941 reading is a record of, of daily overbought uh, ADX record over the last 20 years. The high record before that was back in January 2020 or 2004, and it only reached an 8303. So that is how deeply, deeply overbought this market is on the short term right now. Record levels. So this is my trend template, and I, I my cheapest uh, service the $25 a month service includes trend these trend charts on about a dozen different uh, popular items every night. But the main thing about that $25 a month plan that, that you, you really, really need to know is that, uh, hang on a second. Um, the only Elliott wave that you get the only Elliott wave you get in the $25 a month plan is on Bitcoin. Bitcoin. SID signature combination of Elliott wave and her, uh, and her cycles analysis on Bitcoin. So this only involves um, and provides an out my Elliott wave count on Bitcoin. If you want my Elliott wave count on the S&P, gold, silver, crude oil, bonds, the Russell, the uh, NASDAQ, the, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and several other important uh, sectors, then you you got to go at least to here. Basic plan. And if you want all those screenshots on, Mon on Sundays and on Wednesdays, plus you want my weekly webinar on, on Sundays, and it's $100 a month. But this ain't going to get you anywhere if, if, unless you are, unless Bitcoin is the only thing you trade. Just wanted to make that clear. I have some people misunderstand. It's like, hey, I really like your work. I'm going to subscribe. And they subscribe to the $25 a month plan. It's like, okay, well, I guess you're a Bitcoin guy. Um, but anyway, record levels of overbought. A couple of other really interesting charts I want to show you before I get to the algos about the markets recently. 
Uh, this is a comparison of the, the black line is the RSP, that is the equal weight S&P, and the purple line is the ES contract. So the, the purple line is basically the regular S&P, the market cap weighted S&P. And you'll notice that starting in mid-March of 2023, they, they started to narrow. And by the time you get to late May, you had the the market cap weighted index stronger than the equal weighted index and they continue to widen. So I started these two at identical, the same spot back here you know, at the all time high in early 2022. And you can see that the, and what this essentially means is the largest stocks are what's keeping this market strong. The uh, smaller stocks not so much. I've got more proof of, of, of this that I'll show you. Another thing I want to show you, uh, a couple of interesting charts before we get to the algos. These are um, when the Fed raised. This is um, actually started way back. They, they started raising in uh, March, mid-March of 2022. I've showed this many times, but on television, probably out of self-preservation, they try to make everything about the Fed, and then they can blame the Fed on whatever, on whatever, I guess. Let's say the Fed, it was, the reason the market did this today is because the Fed, da, da, da. So you look here, the Fed raised, market went up. Fed raised, market went up. Fred, Fed uh, was unchanged. And the market was at a temporary peak. Fed raised one more time, market went down. Fed was unchanged, market went down. Fed unchanged, market went up. Fed unchanged, market went sideways. So I, I showed this just to show that all of this talk, 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 talk on uh, financial propaganda TV about the, you know, how does it, and, and trying to put everything through Fed glasses is meaningless, meaningless when it comes to trading the markets. It has no consistent effect. It's all over the place. And we'll talk later about what the Fed really is doing, which is very simple. They're doing the same thing they always done, have done. They're, they're going to adjust their rates to match the natural bond market with typically a five to seven month delay. Now, once in a while, they will use their some sort of agenda that they have. And like they, when uh, bonds started tumbling, uh, from the all-time high recently, uh, I say recently, uh, I can't remember when it was, 2021, I think, uh, they waited uh, like well over a year before they started actually raising. So, so they were very late. And so they had to catch up very quickly. And that lateness was um, through fuel on a a inflationary fire that started in March of 2020 with uh, 2.1 trillion of fresh printed money then and then another few months later another 1.9 trillion of fresh printed money that is all of that money that was printed uh, out of fear of what COVID uh, was going to do uh, really lit the inflationary fire and and now they on television they talk about uh, uh, the the Fed has conquered inflation. Well, I don't think so. Inflation's still going up. We, we prices are still going up. We're at about three percent inflation. So prices aren't coming down. They're still going up. So this is, uh, shows correlations recently between the U.S. dollar. And the S and P, uh, the red line is the Nasdaq, purple line is bonds, and the orange line is uh, gold. And you can see that recently, um, everything that isn't the U.S. dollar has been going up uh, um, 
on the back of a weak dollar. And that was generally the case until very late in the year, December 27. And, the, and then the dollar turned and uh, has given us now one, two, three, four, five waves up. Uh, on the shorter term, we, we have a new trend direction on the U.S. dollar, and it is up. And so what is that going to mean for all of these items up here? Well, it's going to make it very difficult for them to continue to go up. Um, so uh, I want to show you the, 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 this change in the, in, in the do direction of the U.S. dollar recently and, and the immediate effect it's had on everything. Okay, now uh, the uh, we'll go to the algo. So there's two things that premium plan members get that uh, the none of the other lower price tiers get. Now I will say this: uh, if you are subscribed to the hundred dollar month plan, you get the weekly webinar, and in, in the weekly webinar, I freely share what the premium plan people are seeing, but you only get to see it once a week. Premium plans see it every night. And, and what those important things are is the um, momentum algo. So you might say, well, so do you, you're called Elliott Wave Plus. Why would you have momentum algos? And, and the reason is because um, that's why I put that plus on the end of Elliott Wave. I'm not just Elliott Wave. I, I combined Elliott Wave and Hearst. And then I also want people to be aware of what momentum algos are doing in the markets because it's momentum algos are prevalent. They're super important. They're way more important now than they were, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, they have become widely used. And so uh, they're, it kind of lets you know what momentum algos are likely doing. And I think it's important to know. And so uh, what, the first thing you do when you design a momentum algo is you have to, t the momentum algos uh, will trade in, in the direction of the trend only. So you have to have something that is determining the direction of the trend. Well, some people will use, uh, you know, like uh, regular st long only stock market money managers often refer to the 200 day moving average or the 100 day moving average or the 50 day moving average but uh for an algo it needs a definitive um way to determine uh the trend and what i use is the adaptive moving average and i don't use it like uh the, the you know price has to be above the adaptive moving average and there and when, as long as it's above the adaptive moving average then that's that's a trend direction the way i use it is the slope of the adaptive moving average so if the slope of the adaptive moving average is to the upside it will be green if the slope of the adaptive moving average if it's to the downside it will be red um dark red that's a, I wanted a real big contrast between those so as long as this adaptive moving average is green the algo the momentum algo will only take longs it will only go long and the way it decides when to go long it, it is um number one that line must be green and then the other thing that must be green is you you have to be on a positive crossover of the Walter, I call it the Walter Bresser. This is an old indicator, many decades old, called the WB or, or RSI 3M3. It's a double smooth RSI. Okay. And so what I back test for is I, I back test for a moving average of that, well, the, what I call the Walter Bresser. This is also exactly how Walter Bresser, a pioneer in technical analysis, that had suggested using this indicator. It's using these crossover. So uh, when when you get a green a crossover, you have the Walter Bresser move above its moving average that puts this green block there, and it also appears up here. 
And as and as this is green at the time, then that is a momentum buy signal. So it buys at the open of the next daily candle. And it stays long until it gets a some sort of clue that there is a loss of momentum. That's why they call it a momentum algo. Uh, and so right here, we got a negative Walter Bresser crossover, and that is the, usually the way a my momentum algo will exit as soon, if it gets a, an, an opposite Walter Bresser uh, square, a crossover, it will exit at the open of the following ca candle. All of these green squares, green blocks, are winning trades uh, on the algo. And you'll notice that during this nice upswing we've seen recently, it was able to, of course, uh, catch some nice winners some momentum winners on the upside. But if you go back, yeah, there was a, a, a momentum buy here that, that made money. There was actually a momentum sell here that made money. There was a momentum buy here that made money. So there's some, some winning trades in here, but not none of them are really very big. And the further you get back into this choppiness that we have seen, seen well, the, the matter of fact, the biggest winner over the last uh, three years actually was a short, and that was uh, during this last blast down into the uh, this low uh, that occurred in June of 2022. There was also a winner on, uh, on a couple of short winners going down into that important low in October of 2022. But um, so what I do is I have set up all these indicators so that um, I can back test the settings of them. So the, the settings of the adaptive moving average, in this case, back tested well as 8, 6, and 30, and the moving average of the Walter Presser. So we have the trend direction, and then we have enough momentum build up. It takes the buy, and then it exits when it senses a loss of momentum. Also showing on this chart are some extremely important indicators that sometimes come into play. This is the daily sentiment index. This is um, an indicator that costs me a lot of money every year. Uh, and you can see it peaked at 89 back here. And on that day, yeah, that was this day right here, the 89% of retail traders were bullish. So what happens is retail traders uh, are trend followers, and the, the more the market goes up, the more bullish they get. And at major tops, there's almost no retail retail traders left that aren't bullish. They're all bullish, almost all of them. And that often marks a top or a topping zone, topping area. Now back here on this date right here, no October twenty seven. That's this date right here. The there were only ten percent of retail traders that were bullish. That often is an area where you see an important low. And that, that 10 reading right there was one of the reasons why I was bullish on that date. There was a, a week weekend between this candle and that candle. That's the, I already showed you. That was the call I made three months ago where I was bullish until Christmas. Where did the Christmas come in? Well, it didn't come in on this chart. It came in because of Hearst cycle analysis. The composite line was bullish until late in the year. So that uh, low occurred right here. And you can see that the composite line was generally moving to the upside until late in the year. At that time, and there was more than just sentiment 
behind it. There were a lot of other things. There were some divergences, some other things that assisted in that call, but that was actually an easy call to make. And it was shocking because um, I had a lot of people that didn't believe me at all. They thought this thing was going to crash on down from there. And that also was what mainstream Elliott wave service.com uh, was, was, was saying. And I, you, surely you know who I'm talking about. So um, there's the algo. So let me show you very quick on the algo that uh, I've got a number of parameters uh, of all the settings. Uh, I always color this blue. So I'm going to go to edit this strategy. There's all the parameters I test for thresholds on the DSI button to the downside, and the upside. Also, if, if you have a, a unusually long signal candle, how far, how much of a retrace to expect, how many ticks before, before taking that, that buy signal and some other things. But I'm going to run that. I'm going to run that analysis and it's going to show you uh, how much profit this algo would have made had the current settings been in place for the last three years. And notice that, that this is all, um, I've optimized it for the best combination of total dollars profit brought in and winning percentage. And notice the winning percentage is slightly below 50. So there was 39 winners and 46 losers. But the secret to the success was that the average winner was $4,144. And this is one contract, one ES contract at a time. And the average loser was $2,169. So the average winner was about double what the average loser was. Why, why are lo losers so much smaller than winners? Well, it uses a, a, a stop a protective stop and a back test for that. What is the, what is the best stop size to use? And you'll notice that, um, it is using a $2,600 stop. You might say that's ridiculous. I would never use a stop of 26 that huge. Well, that's fine. Then you can, um, tr trade using the, uh, micro e-mini, which is one-tenth the size of the ES contract. So I mean, I, I, but the thing I wanted to show you and the, and the thing I've been pointing, wanting to point to this whole time is when you do the back test, it allows you to look at a equity curve. Had you put this into motion Back three years ago, exactly. This is how much what your account size would look back, look at. And you know what? That's not a great equity curve. It's okay because it puts up sixty grand worth of profit trading one contract at a time. But it has a couple of drawdown periods. This one's not too bad, but this one's ugly. This would be from about November of twenty twenty two through about probably July August of twenty twenty three. It did nothing but lose money. Now it's regained it all. Now, a lot of uh, 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 algo experts would say, well, I would never trade that equity curve. It's not good enough. And so we uh, do something for you quarterly. We prepare something called a, a sortable sp uh, spreadsheet. And remember earlier on when I, when I said there's no, I can see on the chart why the, it's been difficult for uh, the ALGA momentum ALGO to do well on the S&P lately because two out of the last three years were very choppy and overlapping, it, just too noisy. And so what we've done is we've optimized um, the ALGOs on all of these items. There's currencies in there. There's metals, um, crude oil, Bitcoin, uh, gold miners, financial sector, energy sector, emerging markets, German DAX, it's all, all the, 
and I have these sorted and I'm, I'm going to make this available to you when we, when we make the blog post that has the recording of this uh, session here tomorrow or the next day, we'll also include a link where you can download this sortable spreadsheet. It's an actual Excel file. And so the, I've got it um, sorted by three-year return on investment. So we take the account size required to not get margin called at any point during the three years and figure the amount of net profit that it brought the, the, over the three-year period, and we come up with a return on investment percentage. And you'll notice that the top-ranked items are U.S. dollar index, silver, this is over the last three years, Canadian dollar, euro, bonds, and gold. And by the way, last three months ago, gold was number one. So gold has appeared very high in this list uh, recently. So what, what, what's another thing you might want to look at? Well, you want to you certainly want the best return on investment, but how about consecutive losses? How many losses in a row would you put up with from an algo? Well, it says here that the uh, bonds, the ZB contract, futures contract, that'll be 30-year bonds, long-dated bonds, only experienced three losses in a row at any time, at any point over the last three years. On the, during the back test, and that's good. Gold was only four uh, losses in a row, and there were at one point there were seven winners in a row on gold, and a two hundred fifty-seven percent return on investment is pretty good. So uh, the other algo, th this is something that I've been saying now for about six months: is the stock market is not the best thing to trade using an auto, automated uh, mo momentum signals. I just proved it to you. It doesn't sm uh, trade smoothly, smoothly enough. It's too noisy. There's other items that would be excellent uh, trading items. Um, so uh, I, I want to... Uh, what. Uh, one other thing I want to show you is, and I think I'll do this on gold. So one is one of the special things that the premium plan members get is that every night they get this this momentum algo system to see if there's a new buy signal, sell signal, or or change the stop to trailing or exit signal. But I'm going to run to the uh, gold charts, and I, the other thing I'm going to cover. Um, real heavy to, today is some of my uh, gold analysis right now. A lot of there's a lot of gold bulls out there right now. A lot of bullish talk about gold, and um, um, I'm also very bullish on gold on a longer term. And I'm I'm going to show you why. First of all, I'm going to go to the gold chart. So something that really needs to be tracked, if you're if you are a gold person, there's two things that you really really need to track. One is the U.S. dollar index, and then the other, or possibly the euro, if you don't have access to the U.S. dollar index, and the other is sentiment. Sentiment. I'm going to show you both of those right now. So this is a. Uh, long-term Hearst cycle analysis on the U.S. dollar. And um, you'll notice that the composite line over the long haul is very bearish. It's bearish for years. This is moving all the way down to the end of the decade. This indicates that the dollar in, uh, is going to lose buying power. And you know what? It's been losing buying power, really, for a long time, uh, really 100 years, ever since the Fed was brought into existence with their, you know, goal of 2% annualized inflation. 
but it's especially been getting smashed since uh, the year 1985. And I'll show you the charts on the, on the U S dollar, but this, this is the U S dollar uh, that peak that we saw back here. I think it was in September of 2022 late was followed by a five wave down structure. And then, then that was followed by an expanded flat a three waves down to a slight new low for B and then C an impulse to the upside. So the, and then recently the dollar has been moving to the downside. This assisted many items, gold, silver, copper, uh, stocks, bonds, uh, in, to, in, in moving to the, upside so a, a lot of assets will move up while the dollar is moving down but right now and I'm, i've got another view of this is closer up uh and i've got some labels on it uh the u.s dollar is expected to rally through and and um, by the way this date right here the top peak or a secondary to peak on the composite line um, just two days ago was March 22. And so on most of my charts, I'm expecting the dollar to con generally continue to stay up through March 22 and then very bearish on the US dollar. Uh, that has changed midweek here to March 3. I don't and I don't put a lot of credibility into this. The, the little morphing uh, changes from day to day on the composite line. But let's just say that, uh, that we're expecting the dollar to continue to rally. And, and I have already seen five waves up in the U.S. dollar from the most recent low on an on a intraday chart. But expecting the, rally, the dollar to rally at least this weekend, it was expecting the, the dollar to rally through March 22. And then to get hammered to the downside. Well, that the item that that's going to be the most bullish for is going to be metals, certainly gold and silver. Certainly gold and silver. It may not be that bullish for copper if we're going into a recession, which I, a fairly quick, but rather deep recession, which I think we're going to happen. So I think it's particularly bullish for gold and silver and that date on the on my charts is going to be march 22 because that's what the that's how long the u.s dollar is expected to stay up um uh, on that chart i just showed you on Hearst analysis so a, a real problem with gold bu uh, bulls right now is that this move up out of this most recent low was in three waves that's a big problem and uh, so I think we're going to uh, we're going to see gold moving down while the dollar is moving up until approximately March 22 could be a little earlier. But if you look at the long term count on gold, um, you know, whether this is a one and a two here or not, I'm not absolutely cer certain, but this is a wave three clearly in gold. And this is um, a, a sideways ABC pattern for wave four, clearly. Then this is a five wave up structure for wave one again. So I've got this as a black or intermediate degree wave four, looking for a black wave five to the upside. It should subdivide into blue, five blue waves, one, two, three, four, five. Hearst thinks that the next uh, nine-year cycle peak is due in September 2025. The only problem really with the analysis is that after this five-wave up structure, we got three waves down here, but then we got three waves up. So this needs a five-wave structure to the downside to complete an expanded flat for wave two, probably through about March 22, and then gold, I think it's going to rip-roar to the upside. So let's look at the price action on gold. You know, it looks a little noisy over the last three years. You go back three years on the algo, there's one, two, three. So the algo back test is back through this, this point right here now. And it, it does look like a sideways corrective uh, price action. But if you look at um, 
the algo it's been one of the best algos these big big green blocks are winning trades the red blocks are losing trades the reason the red blocks are smaller <clears throat> than the green blocks <clears throat> is because it uses a protective stop that combined with the fact that it has an open profit objective this is the secret sauce so it gets long when when it um has the right uh, walter bresser crossover as well as the adaptive moving average starting to slope to the upside long signal came in right here and <clears throat> It stayed with the trade and got an enormous winner because it, it it didn't have a fixed price objective. It waited until it saw a loss of momentum, and that would be this uh, crossover, Walter Bresser crossover here. That's why the, <clears throat> that winning long trade right there brought in approximately, I'm measuring it, Trading one contract at a time, ten thousand dollars, and that was right after a short trade that had made approximately seven thousand dollars. So, th so this was a short trade that made. A big winner, and this is a long trade that made a big winner. Then he had a loser here. It it tried to short it, but it didn't want to go down. And, and pretty quick, straight away, it was back long again. Another enormous winner. Looks like another about seven thousand dollars. And then most recently, a big winner. There's a loser here, loser here, and here, winner here. And and if you look back at the history, um, and you just eyeball these big um, green blocks and how much bigger they are than the red blocks uh you can see that why the gold algo has been doing well and it's been placing in the top five uh on my sortable spreadsheet so let's look at uh this uh algo and see uh how it back tests I've got a, a lot of uh, parameters that are that I back test so to associated with this algo. I use a different size stop for longs and shorts. I also use a at some point I have it switched to a trailing stop, and I have a different size trailing stop for longs and shorts. And when we run the analysis on it. Over the last three years, had the current settings been in place, 40 winners, 32 losers. And by the way, the last back test three months ago, just as good. And the, the, the settings didn't change that much this time. Very little change. Average, win, uh, uh, average win, winner, 22.37. Average loss, 12.41. So the average winner, once again, just about twice the size of the average loser and the winning percentage was above 500. So no wonder it made, did so well. Here's, here's the equity curve on this one. And while it didn't do that great in uh, 2021, boy, recently it's been just kicking, kicking butt, uh, just doing really well over the last two years, really piling on profits and starting starting here and then $50,000 for the profit tra trading one contract over time over two years. Now, please remember that these results are theoretical to some degree. And, and, and here's what I mean by, by some degree. Yes, I just did the back test. It's optimized for the last three years. It's showing the, mo the rosiest possible picture here. So why don't we go to the, my website and look at um, the nightly reports on the algo starting before I redid the settings. So let's look at the January 2. I, 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 all during the first week of January, I was uh, uh, 
optimizing, back testing and optimizing. And if we go to the gold sentiment, not sentiment, no, gold, yeah, the gold algo. This is before I did any changes. So this, uh, the last time I had optimized this, these settings here, would have been around October 1. That was back here. So all of these winners that occurred across here since October, approximately October 1, were produced real time for premium plan subscribers. Nothing fake about them. They were produced real time for actual premium plan subscribers. Uh, they were notified on the very day of the signal. Because I only do the back testing and the reoptimization once a quarter. So those those winners were real. Um, and uh, I will represent to you that the settings here haven't changed that much. As a matter of fact, I can see what the settings were before. They were 13, 2, and 30 on the adaptive moving average. Now it's 13, 3, and 30. If you saw the difference between that, it, you can't you can't hardly even detect it. And then the the there was a 23 period moving average down there. Now that is now a 12 moving average, which actually would get you into the trades a little quicker than a 23 period moving average on the Walter Bretzer. Those are the two main things about the back tests that and the size of the stop the size of the stop is huge hugely important it must be back tested um and the size of the top stop last time was thirty five hundred and fifty dollars and and now it's only two thousand for longs twenty nine hundred for shorts so we've actually been able to tighten up the stops a little bit with this recent back test. Uh, so the other thing you get as a premium plan member that you only get to look at once a week as um, as a pro plan or $100 a month is this extremely, extremely important uh, proprietary chart template that we use. We call it our sentiment conditions. Sentiment conditions chart template. I've explained this before, and I'll go over it once again. There's some very important indicators on this chart, and, and there's nothing here about Elliott Wave or Hearst. It's all about sentiment, and it really is uh, compares commercials positioning versus retail positioning. So there's three different commercials positioning indicators down here, the, the fast acting, the medium term acting, and the long term. So this shows you the position of commercials as a percent of open interest. That's a Larry Williams idea. And he actually printed in a book, one of his books a couple decade, decades ago, the exact code of, to use in Trade Navigator platform, which this is Genesis, Genesis Trade Navigator, to program in this, this indicator, which gives it it gives you a quicker idea of what the commercials are thinking. So who are the commercials? Well, in the case of gold, the commercials are the gold miners, the gold producers, the gold sellers. So it is in their d distinct business interest that if they think, based on all of their work, that gold is... Uh, um, vulnerable to a move to the downside, they will short it. In other words, they will hedge their business interests. So let's say they got a bunch of gold on hand and they got a bunch of gold in the ground and they're, and they're busy mining that stuff up, but they're expecting gold to move down. Well, what they'll do is they, they hedge. In other words, they short gold. And that way they can make money on gold as it moves down in their hedging accounts. This is extremely important because it, it shows you what the smartest people in the room are thinking. The people whose business it is to know as much as possible about what's going to happen next in the price of gold. Whereas retail traders, 
they're trend followers. And so uh, they will, uh, the more something's going up, the more excited they get. And so we use the daily sentiment index to track where they're at. Invariably, they are deadly short. Like on this day, one of these days right down here, there was only 8% of retail traders that were bullish. And notice that the commercials were loving, they were taking off their hedges. They were thinking, oh, the gold is not going to move much lower. We're getting ready for a, a, a big rally. They, of course, were correct. Retail was all on one side of the boat at the wrong moment, and the boat capsized, and, and we got this enormous rally that started in early uh, October. This is, to some degree, what uh, they mean when they uh, the when they say uh, a short squeeze. So retail was heavily short; they had been shorting it. Whereas uh, uh, commercials were shorting it way back here. And they were gradually taking off the shorts as this made move down. So the, the color of these candles is the color of this slope of, the, of a three-period moving average of the DSI. Now, this is not something you'll get just anywhere because it's, DSI is expensive and you have to subscribe. And um, and then I've also, when it's extremely overdone to the downside, I'm, I'm like in single digits, I have it put up this green zone, this, this bullish. When commercials are all heavily long, there's a green zone and that's bullish. So this, this really created a perfect storm, what I call a perfect storm of uh, spread between the commercials and uh, retail. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> do any other Elliott Wave um, services come any in anywhere close to offering this kind of information within their subscription on a daily basis? I, I know the answer, and the answer is no. This is the only one. But on, but when it comes to sentiment, <clears throat> um, it's huge in precious metals, and it it gives uh, confidence <clears throat> that even though it's been moving down strongly, you can start building a long position. Well, how about how about the conditions right now? Well, they are a problem because commercials, as a percent of open interest are as short as they have been at any point in the last six months. This indicator is commercials positioning as it relates to their most bullish and bearish positioning over the last six months. And they are currently as hedged as they have been at any point in the last six months. And they have been since this peak back here. And this is an even slower acting uh, com commercial uh, positioning indicator. They are also as hedged or as short as they have been at any point in the last 12 months. That, that's when they're below the red lines on these indicators. So they're fully hedged. And the retail has been stubbornly holding on to bullish this really recently. And it, it is really amazing because when you have access to this on a nightly basis, and then you read all of the articles about um, that are super bullish on gold that are constantly bombarding the worldwide interweb, uh, they're, they're worthless they're worthless. This is what this is what is driving it is sentiment. This is what driving the the, the start of rallies and and the end of them. So this is the this is still bearish. 
So when we go back to my my gold uh, uh, thing, that's why I'm expecting this this the, a substantial move to the downside. And um, if this is three waves down for an A and three waves up for a B, wave C will equal 1.618 times wave A at 1732. And 1732 is exa also exactly the point. 382 expansion of a so if you measure the distance of this move down here as a as a unit of one and you take that times 0 0.382 and you look for the the c wave to eventually hit that target so we have a cluster there at 1732 i think that's where gold's going then massive buying opportunity So between the algo and the sentiment on gold, it's been just amazing, amazingly successful. Uh, anyone interested in gold market should, should be a subscriber to my work, at least at the $100 level. Been able to time these swings over and over and over again successfully. So what about silver? Well, same thing on silver. I think it's going to move down through uh, late March. That's the last, uh, at least that's where the U.S. dollar was expected was to stay up on this current rally on the U.S. dollar th through about then. So, so you might say, well, how important is the dollar uh, on these items? So we'll add a comparison signal or, or comparison of uh, the DX to dash 057, the US dollar, and we'll color that green. And then we will flip that upside down so that, and so that is the US dollar index inverted that's moving almost tick for tick really with silver and it's it's doing the same thing with gold too and so the the dollar now now that i have it inverted you can see the dollar has, has given us a five wave up structure that's very likely just the beginning of the dollar continuing to move up so it's inverted so look down here and it's the u.s dollar is generally bullish According to Hearst, all the way to March 22. So, so how's the algo doing on silver? Well, it's doing better now than it has in a long time. Look at all these green winners. Now, this is a back test. But it's it was one of the better back tested items this time. Now it's currently short. It's in a winning trade, but it's but these little arrows here, that means that the Walter Bressert is sloping to the upside. It hadn't crossed over yet. If it does, and it looks like it might, it'll suggest exiting that short position. It's within an eyelash of exiting it. But ever since it the green arrows started to appear and the Walter Bressert was moving up, it started trailing the stop. And you see that the stop is now down pretty close to price and so if this does rally here now and it and it could a bit more it will this trade will end in profit because the stop is here it's it, it got short here but here's the problem with silver same problem same problem with silver commercials are heavily short now retail isn't quite as long. It's dropped down to a 37, but in, but silver really shouldn't become a buy until we get much lower than a 37 on the DSI. It needs to move down pretty close to single digits. And we need to see a change of attitude from the commercials. And guess what? Our premium plan subscribers will know exactly the day that that turns bullish. Okay, so I showed you all the, the uh, wave counts on 
the S and P. Uh, I want to show you a couple more things here. I wanted to show you Bitcoin, and I want to show you popular stocks. So let's move to popular stocks first, because we're back on the on the stock market here. And something I do for subscribers <clears throat> is I do a separate hearse analysis and wave count on an, on a number of the most popular stocks. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the ones I'm keep, keep paying particular attention to right now are the Fang, uh, Fang Plus stock. So uh, you may not, may or may not be aware that there's a Fang Plus ETN that includes these ten stocks in in relatively equal amounts: Meta, Tesla, Nvidia, AMD. Netflix, Apple, Amazon, Snowflake, Microsoft, Google. Snowflake is a more of a crypto-oriented sort of company, apparently. But all, all the rest of those uh, have have recently kind of become become known as the the Magnificent Seven. But there's actually ten in that, and that is the FNGS, a so Fang Plus ETN. So I did a Hearst on this, and here's what the Hearst says on FNGS. <clears throat> it's bullish through February 8th. It's bullish now. So and, and then it's bearish down into September, late September this year. Okay, this is a Hearst analysis. Now this last trough in late October. It's going to be an 18-month cycle trough, and that, that's why it's been so aggressive to the upside, and it, it thinks it's going to continue the upside through February 8th. That's important. That's important, and that's something I keep my subscribers aware of, is if, if, if you remember, if you think back at on uh, the wave count on the S&P, I had one count where it, it might have topped and um and then but the problem is there was this 20 week cycle trough due about now and then it was supposed to move up see anyone remember the date the s p was supposed to move up out of that 20, most recent 20 week trough up into i think it was uh jan 28 jan i think jan 28 dennis let's go back and look Jay says Jan 26 that maybe that's right and uh, so I'm going to show you real quick so just remember FNGS it, it doesn't think it's going to top until February 8th and it thinks it's going to keep good moving higher from here okay that's one of the later topping dates I'm getting out of Hearst right now so on, on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it's projecting the move down into this 20-week cycle trough, do about now, and then a move up through February 4. Well, is it possible that it makes a new high on February 4? Yeah. There's still some Fibonacci targets up here. It hadn't, been, it hadn't hit yet. This downward movement, very weak so far in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So um, and this is why I told my subscribers Sunday, do not fall in love with the short position here. Be very careful because there's a 20-week cycle trough due here. That's no, that's a pretty big trough. And, and the composite line in almost everything is suggesting a rally out of that trough through approximately the end of January. So in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, that date has turned to February 4. Well, let's see what the date is on the S&P, and then we'll also look at the... Uh, uh, Nasdaq and Russell here. Jan 26. Jay, you, you're the winner. Jan 26. But if I repin this to, to a larger cycle trough of 40 week, it's suggesting it could stay up to through February 7. This is something I also mentioned to my subscribers. I'm not short this market yet because uh, I'm there's, because there's a 20 week cycle trough due here and several important items are due to, aren't due to actually peak on the composite line until late January, early February. <laughs>
Uh, let's see here. Um, so I'm, I was asked about the NASDAQ earlier and show you. Let's check those comp- uh, those dates on, on the NASDAQ and the Russell now. Oh, rest assured, uh, Dennis, the J is not the teacher's pet. We have a long history. It hasn't always been great, but it's great right now. So glad glad you stuck around, Jay. Um. Anyway, so I'm going to the Nasdaq and to the Russell. And I'm waiting. Okay. Here, first thing I wanted to, before I show you the dates in late late January or early February, I'll show you this. This is a new chart that I've started developing because uh, the the NASDAQ composite, which is the entirety of the NASDAQ, there's a tremendous amount of stocks in that index that are very, very weak, that, that are actually below a dollar. <clears throat> And so this wave count has, I think, been a little cleaner. This is a monthly chart. So up from the November of 2021 high, um, an A, and then an A and a B, and this is a five-wave structure for C, so it's, it's like an expanded flat. And it's n- really not that close to its all-time high. But it has moved up in five ways, one, two, three, four, five. So... When you take a broad look at the NASDAQ, it it's not as strong. And the uh, current Hearst on it is bearish from Jan 16 through May 2. It also stopped going up exactly at a, a good Fibonacci target where if this was, was wave A, this is a five-wave move, one, two, three, four, five. And this was a three waves up for wave A. That green line right there is where wave C in green would be a 0.618 expansion of A. And it hit that, and now it's hesitating. So that the date on that is Jan 16. Well, what about the NASDAQ 100? NASDAQ 100 is the 100 largest stocks in the NASDAQ. And this is what I've been, and, and notice that the, that index has made a slight new high above its high back in November of 2021. Very slight. So an, an, a long-term view on the NASDAQ is that th- this was primary or burgundy degree wave three. This is wave four in 2022, uh, 2002, and then a one in black, two in black. And then one, two, three, triangle for four, five for three, black three, black four. So once we have a black three and a black four, we can set a target for the end of black wave five, and it hasn't been hit yet. That's at 23.961. And um, Hearst is currently suggesting that it won't top until approximately late 2025. But Hearst is bearish from January 2024 down into August through October of 2024. And so that's why I think that we're still in a wave four. So up from this black wave four, one, and then a big expanded flat for two, that's a three. That's never have I thought that could even possibly be the top. Because it's just the end of of, of a third wave up from this low not five waves up, then uh, a pretty deep wave A, and now we're getting back to kind of a double top of wave B, still need a wave C to finish this blue or minor degree wave four, not going to finish until sometime uh, in the third or fourth quarter of this year, according to Hearst. Look at these huge divergences setting up on the weekly chart. So here's, uh, there was a day, uh, monthly chart. So here's the weekly. So in my estimation, this initial move down was in three waves, but this is just a B wave, a B wave. And we, we've got a C wave coming either that, or we're getting an A, B, 
C D E triangle for wave four and wave four won't end until somewhere in this chronological vicinity of a, the next 18 month cycle trough. That'd be somewhere between late August and mid October. And then a strong fifth wave up from there into uh, uh, the, the latest Hearst says up through July 2025. So I still think we have a fifth wave up in blue that is due from this black wave four back here in late 2018. So one in blue, two, three, possibly four here. If that was a four, this has to be a, a the end of it. And I just don't think it's going to be. This is a B wave. Need a CDE or or a possible five wave C down into this trough, but the date, the reason we went came, came back here to look at the Nasdaq is the date is uh, actually my reason I crossed through that is I haven't updated it. The, the Hearst done today is suggesting Jan twenty eight for a, um, for the top in the Nasdaq. So once again, going back to the FNGS. Uh, roadmap, it thinks it doesn't top until early February. So I think this, um, the bottom line is, I think the stock market is going to stay up until late January, early February. And I think the strongest stocks are going to be the same ones that have been leading. It's it's going to be those Magnificent Seven, or uh, in this case, the, the stocks in the FNGS, they're, they're, they're going to hold this market up. That combined with the fact that there is a 20-week cycle trough due in almost everything here in any moment has been telling me, don't short this market yet. Don't short it yet. It, it need to see how this plays out. Now, we got this big divergence here in the weekly chart. Let's also look at the Russell very quickly. In the Russell, it was actually the Russell when I first started floating the idea that the, that the move up from the March of 2020 low was in three waves and is therefore wave one. And so I started floating that idea way back here in 2021, mid 2021. And I think, I still think it's the right idea for what's going on here. I am looking for a huge cycle peak and that it's probably going to occur in approximately the second quarter of 2026 that's because i do a hearst in all these different items and that generally is about where most of them think it's going to peak now and so if this is a ongoing uh, contracting diagonal um uh, <clears throat> This move to the downside was just the first leg, and then all this sideways junk is just a bare flag. And we've got to see a finish to this structure, down, sideways, down. Her cycle analysis agrees that we're going to move down from approximately late December all the way into June next. And um, it is likely to be a five wave structure. And you, you see, I have a target way down here at 1309. How big of a move is that to the downside in the Russell? Do you ask? Well, and that would be kind of the, the high target. 33%. So I'm looking for a, a, a move down through mid year that is substantial this year and then an incredible opportunity buying opportunity in the markets for about a double doubling of stocks and then here's the russell daily notice something about the russell daily there's a 20-week cycle trough due somewhere between jan 5 and jan 11 and it it looks like it might have quit going down Matter of fact, it just barely subdivided into five waves down, one, two, three, four, five, with a really abnormally short fifth wave. So I'm going to move into an intraday chart on that on the Russell. 
one and a two up here, then one, two, th three, four, five, or three here, four, five. So this does look like it, it gave us a fifth wave down. It was a, a normal fifth wave target would have been way down here, and it, it really just stopped. Now, we could still be in a fourth wave, but probably not because there's this 20-week cycle trough window that is due and it's about to run out. So I, I think, but I do think a person can construe this as a impulse to the outside. It's the only of the Brussels, NASDAQ, S&P, and uh, Dow. It's the only one that really looks like you could even call it a five. And therefore, it could be that uh, the, the Russell is topped, but we're, but notice, I'll move back to the daily chart, the date uh, that the composite line is, is suggesting that it's going to rally up out of this 20-week cycle trough all the way to Jan 31. So what is it saying? It, when the, on balance, when you look at everything, uh, what that suggesting to me is, is don't even think about shorting this market until we get to late January at the earliest. Uh, that's that's the moral of the story. So we, we have all of these dates that the composite line think that we're going to bounce out of the 20-week cycle trough. Some of them as early as Jan 26, other as late as February 9, and that, that later date is coming from the, uh, the Magnificent Seven group. So there's the Russell. Um, let's see what else. Um, I think uh, you probably heard me speak enough about um, Hearst in this webinar to understand now why I integrate it into my Elliott Wave counts very, very carefully and um, and consistently. You know, Hearst is just like Elliott Wave; it's not perfect. And I'll tell you what: El Elliott Wave in most people's hands is dangerous because it's, it allows bias to come in and what Hearst um, does is it, it eliminates all of this bias crap. And so I end up like integrating my accounts into a Hearst uh, roadmap. Uh, and you wouldn't believe how much it has helped me. For instance, my main count on the Dow and the S and P is the same now as, it, as it was six months ago and i started first started floating the idea of an ending diagonal uh, up from the uh, march of 2020 low and not ending until 2026 uh a couple of years ago and so i don't have to change my wave counts as often and can um but i can still look at the internal wave structures set the fibonacci targets uh, just like a regular Elliotician, but I I really believe it allows me to see through see around corners better than um, any Elliotician that uses Elliot Wave alone. So um, another thing that um, on the uh, sentiment, notice the sentiment on. Um, and this is the cinema condition screenshot, proprietary screenshot that the premium plan members get to see every night. Uh, pro plan members, $100 a month, get to see it once a week <clears throat> during the webinar. Commercials are heavily short. This is also the, the case with the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average. This is not the case with the S&P. So the positioning of the commercials is a little less reliable when it comes to stock markets. However, uh, when they're short at the same time you, as you're getting some real high readings on the DSI, it is a warning that you're you're in you're you're nearing a, a an important potential peaking or topping zone. Um, 
But notice there's something else on all of these charts, and it's um, seasonality. There's a big bullish seasonality in the NASDAQ that happens every year from May 19 all the way to July 28. You may not have known that, but that was on my charts. And my subscribers were able to see that. Um, it, not every um, seasonality period ends out uh, ends up working perfectly, but when you see the, where the seasonality period is, and by the way, this this seasonality also comes from paid service, and it's basically means that eighty percent of the time over the last fifteen years, so twelve out of the last fifteen years, if you took a the stock market all 15 of those stock markets you turned it into a composite line was up from this date to this date 12 out of the last 15 years so sometimes it works and sometimes it, it doesn't and I'll, I'll tell you that when it usually when it works is when it it, it is in perfect harmony with uh, the sentiment conditions. And so uh, you also get to see um, periods of bullish uh, seasonality on lots and lots of items uh, as a premium plan subscriber. Uh, for instance, you, you get it on all of the uh, futures contracts that are covered by the premium plan a nightly algo. So it would be the Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, crude oil, German DAX, Dow Jones Industrial Average, Euro, gold, NASDAQ, Russell, uh, silver, US dollar, and bonds. But you also uh, get, uh, as a premium plan member, uh, some other stuff, uh, and that is additional sentiment conditions on virtually every trade, major tradable commodity, cocoa, coffee, copper, corn, cotton, heating oil, lean hogs, live cattle, natural gas, orange juice, platinum, uh, gasoline soybeans, sugar, and wheat. So we'll just take a look at it, and let's look at platinum. There's a lot of bullishness on platinum currently, but this is tonight's uh, sentiment screenshot on platinum. And and for this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually move. So there's been some bullishness out of a few corners out there on platinum recently. So I'm going to go to industrial metals. We'll take a quick look at that just to show you how much sentiment information uh, you get as a premium plan uh, member here. And uh, so we move to platinum sentiment. There's some big platinum bulls out there being real loud and real proud of this thing of platinum moving up now during this period here out there. I get some emails from them, but now we have platinum coming down and overlapping this peak right here. Why did it do that? Why isn't this a one, two, and the three just kept going? Well, there's several reasons and they're all shown on this chart. Number one, the ADX indicator was over 60 on a daily chart. That's what put in this brown zone here. We, the last time we got a brown zone was at this very important peaking area back in uh, April of 2023. Also, commercials are all heavily short right now. In other words, this is no time to be getting long platinum. The the, the commercials, the the Producers are fully hedged, all three measures, the fast, medium speed, and slow speed acting. 
um, as Larry Williams uh, has said in many of his books, you, ju- you just don't want to bet against those guys. It, if you do, it needs to be a short-term trade. Anyway, um, that is, uh, I think that's, uh, does anybody have any requests to take a look at my wave count very quickly on, on anything else? Still got a bunch in a room. Please use the chat. NVIDIA, sure. Uh, NVIDIA seems to be like the last holdout. The last holdout for upward movement. And oh yeah, Bitcoin, yeah. Forgot about Bitcoin. So I'm, I'm going to go, uh, while I'm on uh, popular stocks, I forgot to run through the the projected peaking dates on the, the popular stocks. I'm going to do that. I'm going to show NVIDIA, and I'm also going to show an important stock uh, that's very meaningful um, when it comes to Bitcoin. So I'm going to start. I'm just going to flash through like I do in the Sunday webinars. So on Apple, I don't think it's peaked yet. I think Apple will eventually peak at about $274 a share. That's based on the wave count in Fibonacci. Notice the leading diagonal for one and then a two. This is the entire history of Apple. And then one, two, three, four, five for three, four. So we're in a fifth wave up from the beginning of Apple. And I think we've got a one, two, and three, and four in place. The four is either here or it might be over here. And moving into the weekly. I think the four ended very quickly and we entered into an ending, expanding diagonal, one, two, three, four. And then very importantly, up from that low in January of 2023, five waves up for A, and now we're in a B wave. And Hearst thinks that Apple is going to move up between Jan 10 and Jan 30. I think that will complete a small degree B wave and then we'll have a five wave down structure into somewhere of the next 18 month, possibly nine year cycle trough due in as early as July of this year. Then you get a blow off move up, up into the third quarter of next year of the end of a expanding ending diagonal. As a matter of fact, I'm going to extend this to the right and figure that that is going to provide support. So this this is still projecting a pretty substantial move down from Jan 30 into that July through October window. Uh, potentially drop a 30% on Apple. And then an explosive blow-off screaming move up to two of in this case potentially all the way up to 317 a share how about amazon i don't think amazon's done with a large degree wave four but i think we could see a major plunge in amazon and the projected peaking date on amazon is february 2 down into july boeing boeing uh had some extremely bad news come out about it uh, I, th- I think that's probably the it's put in its peak for now, and it's going to move down uh, all the way through late August next in quite a plunge. So on Boeing, A, B, C for W, and then a five wave A, a corrected B, and then one, two, three, four, five. And this would be a rare instance where the wave the wave C of a zigzag is unable to make a new high above wave A of the zigzag. It's rare, but it can happen, and it appears to be finished. Uh, Disney, I'm not going to bottom until mid-year, I don't think. Meta, putting in a peak up here. Uh, the puzzle line thought it would peak uh, last time I did uh, uh, on Dece- December 23. Google, <clears throat> I think it's putting in an ending contracting diagonal and will peak, according to the puzzle line, Jan 23. 
Microsoft, I think rallies until February 1, puts in a peak there. It's just a B wave. And then we get a C wave down to finish an expanded flat that started back here in July. Down into June, then a, a huge move up to 533 a share, up from 278. That's basically a double. Netflix probably has topped NVIDIA. NVIDIA is the only, the most bullish thing looking, and it must be trying to put in a five wave up structure, uh, potentially two six, through 693. Um, it's going to have to swim against the tides in, in order to, to do that. I don't see anything else really looking that particularly strong, but I, but it, it appears to have broken out in these one, two, and it's in a wave three. It needs to finish at three, four, five. Could it end as a diagonal, something more overlapping? Yeah. We'll watch for that. Um, the Hearst I just did suggests a peak on February four. And then a plunge down into July, August time frame. Notice these. Sometimes I draw these manual phasing on these on these troughs, suggesting that, that Nvidia could have a lousy second half of the year, or most of this year, the rest of the year after it peaks, even though it's screaming higher right now. Tesla may have already peaked in this wave too, and it's on its way down. There's a few others, but, um, <clears throat> and I already showed you FNGS and how it's, uh, might continue to grind higher and stay up longer than about anything through Feb 8. That said, uh, this is really suggesting the difference between these dates, the Feb 8 date and the late January dates on some of the indices indicates that it is in fact going to be the Magnificent Seven that's going to hold this market up through, uh, potentially through early February. This is the stock I was talking about. This is uh, Marathon Patent Group Incorporated. I think they they call it something different now, but it's Marathon something. And this is a good proxy. This stock is a really good proxy for Bitcoin. And uh, so it, from its inception, plunged, plunged, plunged down into this important low at 35 cents a share back in uh, March of 2020. And then the good news for this stock is it appears to have given a five wave up structure out of the low. One, two, three, four, five for one, two, and then one, two, three, four, five for three expanded flat for four and then a fifth wave up through the November 20 of 2021 high. I believe that is when Bitcoin peaked, but here's the bad news for this stock. That was followed by a very, just like Bitcoin, a very clear five wave down structure down through late 2022. That is trouble. And here's more trouble. The upward movement since December, 2022 is corrective. It's choppy, overlapping. There's no third wave element. It started with a three wave structure to the upside. I'm calling that a wave W and that's a wave X. And I'm calling this an expanded flat A, B, C to complete a W, X, Y pattern and therefore wave B. And there was two Fibonacci targets up here for this peak, 3076, in uh, 2847, both of those uh, were hit by this most recent spike. And what's so if we have a five to, da to the downside finished and a, um, a fairly deep correction finished, there's, there's the 0.618 retrace level, there's the 0.786, there's another Fibonacci uh, that I use and it's pretty commonly hit and that's the 707 fib and that's exactly where it went <clears throat> and then would expect a five wave structure down and if this was wave a of a zigzag a good target for wave c of the zigzag would be a 0.382 expansion of a and all of this has to be done by the way on a 
Fibonacci uh, on a Similog. Some some uh, platforms call it uh, log scale, but a Similog scale. And this, the drawing tools must be used Similog. Very important. Um, I have found that uh, Trading View it does offer that. Similog uh, charts, all at um, any time frame, and Similog drawing tools, and it's very very fast. I kind of like that platform's uh, Trading View uh, as a potential alternate in case something blows up with Genesis Trade Nav Navigator which I'm keeping my fingers crossed that never happens because I've, as you can tell, I've got hundreds and hundreds of wave counts, Fibonacci targets and Hearst analysis all worked up in this platform. Uh, having done this for subscribers since 2010. But anyway, look at, so that, that target is 89 cents. This, the, this item just, peaked at 30 bucks that's a 96 percent plunge so am i am i bullish on bitcoin forget about it i'm extremely bearish on bitcoin and i have been for a while because in bitcoin i recognize this five wave up structure and then we're, we're going to go to bitcoin next and, and look at th this movement to the upside which i think is a very very clear corrective pattern, a very common one. So I'm going to move to uh, cryptos and we'll look at Bitcoin. So why, why would Bitcoin be so, why would I be so bearish on Bitcoin right now? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be very honest you, with you on what I think about Bitcoin. Um, I, when I was a young man, my I, my very first really good job, I was work. I worked for a computer land store. This was in the the early to mid '80s when pers uh, during the personal computer explosion. And um, when I first went to work selling personal computers out of a retail store, the biggest selling uh, computer was. The Apple II, the Apple II, and two is like a two a Roman, you know, two eyes. If you want to look up what they look like, if anybody old enough to have actually used an Apple II in the room? <laughs> anyway, I used to sell them a bunch. Yeah, on two E, yeah, it was the portable version. Of, well, no, it was a two C. Yeah, the two E was the last version of Apple II. Uh, very popular. And uh, then in uh, the early 80s, uh, the Mac came out, Macintosh came out in 84. And I sold the first, I don't know how many dozens of Macintoshes in my hometown. And, uh, <clears throat> but also at that time, the IBM PC had hit the scene and was, had taken it by storm. It was originally a DOS machine. And then some years in, in the late 80s, it, it became a Windows machine, and everything just took off from there. <laughs> but to me, uh, Bitcoin is like, uh, investing in Bitcoin is like investing in an Apple II. Oh, that's cool, Bill. Got the brokerage business in 87. Uh, that was the um, October 19. That was real close to that crash in 87. I remember that crash in 87, uh, boy, destroyed our fourth quarter in, in, in the computer business. But anyway, um, <clears throat> to me, investing in Bitcoin is kind of like investing in, in Apple II, in an Apple II because it's antiquated. It's a technology-based item, and it's old. It's like the original one. Why would I want to invest in the Apple II computer today? That's the way I feel about Bitcoin. Yeah, in, in, in a way, it represents something that could become something in the future, and, you know, digital currency. 
but it certainly has not been uh, really accepted as uh, as a useful uh, currency uh, that is usable out in you know the public by everyone. It just it's not fast enough. It's antiquated. So eventually, there probably will be something fast enough, but it's not going to be Bitcoin. And th therefore, I think that this peak in November of 2021 was as high as Bitcoin will ever go. And then it's going to collapse into oblivion and eventually be priced at zero. So that may not agree with what you think about Bitcoin, but that's what I think. And, and the fact that it has made it into the futures market and the ETF market is a miracle. And it's something that can be taken advantage of, but it's going to collapse. I don't, uh, this, uh, this five waves down from that November, 2021 high is critical business. And then the upward movement since then also very rec easily recognizable Elliott wave structure, five waves up for A, a triangle for B. I remember a triangle and Elliott wave cannot appear in a wave two position. And then a terminal thrust out of the triangle, which, yeah, it's moved a little further than I thought it would, although it's still easily within parameter. Uh, it, and now it has retraced a bit more than 0.618 of the original five waves down. Matter of fact, it's almost reached the 0.786 retrace, a pretty deep move. It's deeply overbought on this weekly chart. Notice the target for a wave three down. So if this is going to be one, two, and then we get a one, two, and on down uh, through subsequent weird years, got a target down here of 1374 it's currently 46,000 so uh, here's a look at the upward movement from November 2022 after the clear five waves down one two three four five that's really clear but then a sideways triangle a b c d e it's perfect and now this is acting just like a terminal thrust out of a triangle. And it's acting like it's probably finishing now because it initially it was moving up in this channel, this blue channel where I connected two and four and put a parallel copy at three. And, but now during this fifth wave up, it's managed to scrabble its way just a little higher, but it's moved out of that channel. And it got this really weird long wave four, and now the fifth wave up. So there was a lot of news on, on Bitcoin tonight, on the news, because somebody hacked Twitter, or X, and uh, announced that this new ETF that they've been talking about like crazy was coming out. Well, the last time a major... Um, Every time some some new way to trade Bitcoins come out, it's actually marked in, uh, an important top. So in uh, December of 2017, just a few weeks before that peak, maybe two or three weeks, that's when the Bitcoin futures, full-size futures contract came out. And I remember when that happened because Bitcoin had been moving up. And if you were just investing in Bitcoin uh, before that, there was no way to short it. There was no way to short it. And um, none that that was available at Coinbase. All you could do is really buy it. So at that moment, it became shortable by the big boys. The futures traders. And the, the ones with the deep pockets. And that's exactly what happened. It moved down in three waves. And there's been some other additions along the way, but this latest edition of um, of a new uh, ETF that is uh, based not on the futures contract, but on the uh, but on the cash index. I don't see how that adds really any real functionality or to Bitcoin. 
uh, trading Bitcoin. We already have a BITI and BITO. BITO is ProShares ETF to go long. Bitcoin BITI is available to go short. But anyway, this looks like a finished pattern. And even as we move into the 240-minute chart, so from this blue wave four, one, two, three, and then this massive sideways wave four, it's almost like the market was afraid to short it because this ETF was coming out. And that would cause, according to all the talking heads that are promoting it, that would create this new way to invest in Bitcoin, which I think is a crock, a complete total crock. So, uh, had this very long pink wave four and now a five wave up structure here. One, two, three, four. Very quick spike tonight and then reversal. Even if the ETF didn't come out tonight and, and, and the announcement was that it, it it had been approved, I think we it gave us a sneak peek of what is going to happen to Bitcoin when that thing gets released. It, it's going to, I think it's going to be a sell the news event. We got a sneak peek at it because it spiked gave us that new high and immediately reversed and started getting shorted. Um, I also have a Hearst analysis screenshot of what Hearst thinks is going to happen next on Bitcoin. And there it is, a, a hammer jump down into basically early August, an 18 month cycle trough. So the, there's the current price. And this is what the composite line is suggesting going to happen. Um, anything else, um, besides Bitcoin, anyone it's, uh, we're getting past two hours. I don't want this to get much longer. Um, may, may I'd like to make a recommendation and is please subscribe to my service. Um, you know, I don't, you know, I don't give any free trials. I don't do that, uh, any of that kind of marketing anymore. Most of the great majority of my subscribers have been with me multiple years. And most of them um, already uh, are subscribing to e either the pro plan or the premium plan. So it's 100, month, 100 a month or 200 a month. So I showed you how to subscribe. I wish you would. Uh, and uh, you could join uh, some a, a, a really smart and um, group of of traders and investors. Uh, I would say most of my subscribers are either money manager, professional money managers, or professional traders. So that is everything uh, that I that I'm going to show you this week. Uh, you, you know, as far as real estate, there was a question about that. So just send me an email. Uh, I'll try to get you a chart on it. Thanks for joining me. And um, I, I think we're at an amazing, critical moment in the markets. Uh, and so uh, left nothing out. Uh, and um, have a great rest of your week and a month and year. Talk soon. Bye-bye.